A hundred years ago, 15 motion picture photographers in the early days of Hollywood formed a group to exchange ideas on the artistry of camera work. They would soon become the American Society of Cinematographers. The ASC is the oldest and possibly most exclusive cinema society in the world, an organization where membership is by invitation only and one of the highest honors in filmmaking. Over the decades, the ASC has followed its mission to stay on the forefront of evolving technology while promoting education through master classes led by members mentoring the next generation of cinematographers. Housed in one of the oldest buildings in Hollywood, entering the home of the ASC is an amazing experience for any film lover. It's a museum of one-of-a-kind film cameras that recorded countless classic films of Hollywood. Stunning behind-the-scenes photos, an amazing cinema memorabilia, from one of the Lumiere Brothers' cinematographs to the Mitchell BNC2 camera that Greg Tolan used to shoot Citizen Kane. To mark the centennial of the ASC, we sat down in the clubhouse off Hollywood Boulevard to chat with four ASC cinematographers. On part two of our series of interviews at the ASC Clubhouse, we speak with John Simmons, an award-winning cinematographer for film and television, who is also a still photographer, painter, and multimedia artist. He grew up in Chicago and, like many DPs, began his career taking pictures. He speaks passionately on his enduring love of still photography, on being a champion for diversity in the ASC, and how early influences encouraged him not only to pursue a career in cinema from photography, but how they still guide his ongoing drive to be a mentor to up-and-coming visual storytellers. John, it's great to meet you and be here. Uh, really special just to, just to be here alone, but to meet you, it's really cool. I'm really interested well, I, in your... I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really curious about your photography background. Um, you started, like a lot of cinematographers, in still photography, You're, and you continue to do it now. Tell us a little bit about uh, what inspires you to keep shooting uh, stills. You know, it's interesting because I've always had a deep love for the image and to be able to uh, have a certain narrative to the art that I do. I started actually as a painter and a multimedia multimedia artist. I still do those. Um, nobody's ever seen them except a few people. Um, and one day I was looking at my friend's brother, Bobby Sangstag. His family owns the Chicago Daily Defender newspaper, the oldest black publication in the country. And he was just so hip. You know, he had Nikons hanging all around him and I'd spend time in the dark room with him and just see this amazing work. He's collected by many people, his works in the Smithsonian and it's a wonderful, generous cat. And I um, asked him if I could use his camera at a publisher's convention. And he said, yeah, you know, and I took some pictures and we developed a role and he said, man, you've got an eye. And he gave me a book by Roy D. Carava called The Sweet Fly Paper of Life. And I realized that that was something I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to tell a story with a camera. And it was interesting because there are a few photographers that were influential in my community at that time. A guy named Billy Abernathy, amazing photographer. Uh, I won't name all of them, but they all said, man, you have to shoot a full negative. You have to shoot a full frame. You have to take a picture without cropping. And that was my challenge. And it's so funny because uh, Billy Abernathy has a book called In Our Terribleness, and it's really nice. And I looked at that book the other day. So many photographs are cropped, but nonetheless, it gave, <laughs> it gave me something to strive for. And it actually helped in cinematography because as cinematographers, we don't get to crop, you know? And I'm sorry, I might be going off on your question. No, no, that's okay. Um, no, keep going. But it is, I mean, it's true, you know, I mean, that's, you know, when I was learning, it was like, the, I mean, when we printed, we, we cut out the negative carrier, you know, so people could see. Yes, didn't crop. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, I've always been in love with, you know, taking a picture, making images, telling a story, and it was something that I could do. 
you know, I wanted to be a musician. You know, I had a saxophone. It was in the 60s, you know, everybody was hip and all this nice stuff was going on, mm. poets, yeah. the Vietnam War, flower power, the civil rights movement was, mm. you know, was in the full effect. So it was an interesting time and a very passionate time. And it was perfect to be able to take pictures in the 60s, you know, it provided a wonderful opportunity. And I uh, fell in love with the work of so many photographers, Cartier-Bresson and Gordon Parks, and you know, the list goes on. And um, I just wanted to do that. Uh, I had received a scholarship to Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. And a man named Carlton Moss, who um, would come to Nashville twice a month and do a lecture on the image of the black man in American cinema. And one day I showed him my photographs. And he said, you're a cinematographer. Mm. By looking at your, your pictures. I didn't know what that, I, I didn't even know what a cinematographer mm. was, right? I mean, I grew up in Chicago, mm. it wasn't, that wasn't a topic. And Carlton, uh, interesting guy, he lived with W.B. Du Bois. He was Paul Robeson's road manager. He was Lena Horne's road manager. He worked at the Mercury Theater with John Houseman and uh, wow, Orson no Welles. Wow, kidding. Right? Wow. He was just an amazing man. Wow. And um, there's another filmmaker named Usman Sambini, who's the father of African cinema. And he came to Nashville to do a talk and to screen a film. And all of a sudden, one day, there was a knock on my door. I lived in a little $80 apartment in an alley, right? And there's Carlton and Usman and a, an interpreter with him. Johnny, show your photographs to him. It's like early in the morning. I show them to him. He says, you're right. He is a cinematographer. So Carlton got me a subscription to American Cinematographer oh, Magazine. Wow. <laughs> there were, there was this uh, couple, Cal and Ross Bernstein, they owned a company called Dove Films, and they worked with Vilmos, they owned a company with Haskell, right? And um, Carlton was blacklisted during the McCarthy era. And as he prepared his case, he lived with Cal and Ross Bernstein. So those people were very supportive of my career, and they sent me a 16 millimeter Aries <laughs> to Nashville where I messed up a lot of films. I was going to say, did you know how to load it? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't know how to load it. I mean, I think I, the first role I ever loaded, I you know, got light leaks on it. It was uh, quite a learning experience, especially because no one was there. But I'm forgetting something. Where I fell in love with cinematography was Carlton was making an industrial film in Nashville, Tennessee. And Irving Lerner was the uh, director. And God. Man, how could I forget this guy's name? Maybe I'll remember. Nothing may come to you. But um, I was working as a PA, <clears throat> and they let me look through the camera. And I looked through the camera. I saw that shutter move, which nobody gets to experience now, right? <laughs> and I panned, and I fell in love. <laughs> it was all over after that. <laughs> it was all over. I had to be a cinematographer. <laughs> Given your experience of being mentored so well. I mean, that's such, such a great story. Um, what, do you, what do you do and what do you uh, promote with, in the ASC with, uh, with mentorship? Well, I think that mentoring comes pretty natural to me. Uh, I stand on the shoulders of so much generosity and so much concern to move my career forward. You know, I've had the support of so many people it just becomes natural to be able to share. And in terms of mentoring, um, in the ASC, we have a committee called the Vision Committee that was established in 2016. And we are concerned about changing the face of the industry. And we wanna be able to move those under, dis, underserved people forward, women and minorities in general. And when I speak of minorities, that includes everybody, you know? and it's more than just being concerned with diversity, but being concerned with inclusion, to be able to make that happen. And fortunately and unfortunately, our society and our views and opinions are so much influenced by our optics, what we see. 
to be able to picture a cinematographer being a woman, a cinematographer being a black man, a, a cinematographer being a uh, Latino, is something that has to be developed in terms of the imagery that's presented to society. Because as a culture, when you think of, when, well, it's a little change right now because of what's going on, but when you think of a president, the image that comes to your mind is not Obama. You know, when you think of a corporate head, you don't think of a woman or a black man or even an Asian right away. That's not what you see. So we're about changing not only um, the actual um, way that society uh, sees us, but in a more inclusive way, so that when you think of a cinematographer, you think of Dana, you think of Rachel, you think of Bradford Young. You know, you see that as something as natural as whatever else you've ever seen throughout history, you how, know? But how? How do you go about making those changes? How does the, you how have does the to, ASC... You have to be able that? to talk about very uncomfortable things. You know, you have to be able to just bring it to people's attention, people who have the ability to make a difference. As a cinematographer, I had a very difficult time in my early years. It was not a very welcoming environment. And whenever you see any of us working, it's a matter of uh, loving what you do. It's not the most logical choices or the most reasonable choices but it's based upon a certain love and passion to be able to express what you want. So the passion has to be greater than the obstacles. Mm. And what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to support those, that passion. Is so, that answering your question? Yeah, I mean, but are there specific programs that the ASC uh, well, has we, like an outreach type We have of an thing? outreach program. We do, we do mentoring uh, through the uh, Vision Committee. We also have um, what's called Friends of the ASC where everybody is included. You can have relationships with cinematographers on the internet. And, you know, we have programs. We put together something called um, Women's Day. And um, I don't know, maybe 150 women showed up for the event. Mm. We had another one called Changing the Face of the Industry. And um, I don't know how many people we had uh, at that event. It was very crowded. And just last week at Cine, uh, Cine Moves, we had an event called Crane Day, and it was um, all about um, inclusive environments to be able to have the unserved cinematographers there. Not only that, but for the most part, when I was growing up, cinematography was a pathless land. Mm. I didn't really have a relationship with a lot of cinematographers, you know? And cinematographers work alone. So as these people strive to move their careers forward, it's great to be able to have an organization that becomes a compass that helps to navigate your career towards those people that will push you forward. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, growing up, my impression was that it was this like pinnacle that was very exclusive and it was, you know, you had to be introduced and you had to know the right people and all that. Do you think that's changing a lot? You know, there's a consciousness of contribution going on, and it's happening in so many areas. It's changing a lot. It's a slow process, but it's, it's really beginning to change. But what happens is like, because of my beginning and the way it was and the lack of feeling included, I knew that there was a different way to do that. And when I became a cinematographer, I wanted my sets to look like the society that we lived in. I want those sets to feel like something that a 12-year-old girl or 12-year-old boy could look in the window, peep through the stage door, mm. and see a possibility of fulfilling a dream. Mm. Because when I first started, I had the passion to do it. And with Carlton Moss, we made a lot of documentaries. I used mm. to camera operate and shoot for him on these historical black biographical documentaries. Mm. So I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And um, nothing could stop me from doing that. So I knew that 
when I got into a position of decision making, I could bring people in that represented society in that way, that could present a set that, um, you know, felt welcoming to all kinds of people. And to be able to do that, I had to be able to translate that idea to my gaffer, to my key grip. You know, you have to have a crew that looks like this, mm. you know? Mm. And that's what I do, and a few of us do that. And still, there's sets that don't look that way. And we have to really make the effort to change that. And the Vision Committee brings that awareness uh, through our magazine, through our website, and not only just cinematographers, but ASC members, because it's about changing the consciousness of people and mm. recognizing the value of their contributions, mm. you know, because all of us make this thing up. What keeps you inspired creatively? Well, th for me, the creative process is always a state of becoming. It never has an arrival. You know, we're always approaching new horizons. Every day when I go to work, it's new. When I wake up in the morning and I move forward, it's, it's just always a brand new experience, you know, to turn a light off, or turn the light on, put a camera here. You know, it's, it's endless, the process. So I'm naturally inspired because I just love taking pictures. You know, I, there was, a period that, you know, I did a few shows, that's what got me into school. I started taking pictures when I was 15 years old, you know, and they're street pictures and they're very close to me. And I did a few exhibits. I got into school because of them, like I said. And um, once I got into cinematography, I stopped printing and just the pictures kind of took a rest. I never stopped taking photographs, mm. but I stopped printing mm. and I had a very close friend who was also a mentor. Um, you know, Chicago is an interesting city. So I had dropped out of school and all my friends had dropped out of school and we were doing self-realization through self-destruction <laughs> like everybody was doing in the 60s. Yeah. And I um, was inspired by my friend Wayne. He was a writer and he would just share such wonderful things with my friends and I that it made us go back to school. Mm. It made us put a paperback book in our back pocket. Mm. So Wayne um, and I, after a number of years, um, I got back in touch with him and he was practicing Tai Chi and I practiced Tai Chi. So that created a whole new relationship. So I'm going up to Oakland to see him one day and he says, I have a pain in my side, which turns into pancreatic cancer. And in the last days of his life, I was there with him for two weeks. And I looked at all the things that he had written and all the stacks and notebooks mm. that nobody will ever see, nobody will ever read. And I walked into my little studio in East LA and I was looking at a photograph of the Black Panthers. And I said, God, nobody's seen this stuff. Mm. Even if I die, my family won't even know where it is. Mm. So I began to print all kinds of print photographs. I printed 120 pictures and framed them 10 at a time. And I came to the ASC for a meeting one day and Charlie Lieberman and I were talking in the parking lot and I showed him the photographs. And he said, man, I need to introduce you to someone. So he introduced me to a guy named Armando Aricio who had a photo gallery called The Perfect Exposure. And that's where I did my first photo exhibit. And the photo exhibit was very successful. In two months, over 2,000 people saw the exhibit. And I had been teaching school at UCLA for 26 years. So I multiplied 28 students a year times 26 years. And I decided that that's enough of that. Mm. And I started to give myself to my photographs more. The act of taking the picture is a moment in time frozen. We stop time, but the photograph itself has a life into eternity. I walked into the gallery one day and uh, it was about four in the afternoon. The gallery was empty except for this one woman and the gallery was over on 6th Street, um, not far from Wilshire and Normandy, the business district. 
And this woman's there, and she's dressed like a businesswoman. She's a white lady. And she walks in, and she looks around, and I come back, and when I come in, she says, the gentleman told me that you took these photographs. I said, yeah. She says, um, I bought one of them. And her eyes start to tear up. And I'm like, this is about to be pretty interesting, <laughs> right? <laughs> so she says, I bought the photograph of the two shoes, and it's this little girl's feet in the photograph, and she has mixed, mismatched shoes on. Mm. And, you know, there's watermelon seats on the steps. It's like you could tell that it's a very urban image. And a woman says, I've had a very fortunate life, more fortunate than most. And I bought that photograph, and I'm going to put it next to my front door. And when I walk out of my house every morning, I'm going to be twice as grateful for the life that I've had. And I'm gonna share that with people. And I was like, you're about to make me tear up. So the effect of that picture changes someone. And that new person influences the next person. And that next person is influenced by the values that were established by that person, that first person. Mm -hmm. And they're all the result of experiencing an image. So, that's my new concept I'm yeah. playing with right now yeah. is the eternal effect of the image. Mm. You know, just like movies and music become the images and soundtracks of our lives. Mm. Like I saw Diana Ross last night, mm. 75 years old. Did she not tell the story of my teenage years mm. in all her songs? Yeah. Mm. So, I don't know. Well, we got, we got to wrap it up, but um, what's coming up for you? What projects do you have on the horizons? I never know what's coming up. You never know what's no, coming up? I never know. I've never been one of those cinematographers. You don't worry about it? You just it, When it happens, it happens. I don't worry about it. <laughs> I feel like there's a, quite a bit of abundance in the universe, and I feel like it's so far been showering me with good ideas and blessings and mistakes to grow from, and things like that. Yeah. I'm so uh, proud to have met you and uh, thank you for sharing your uh, background and it's a really interesting uh, background that a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily know about, you know, they might know about, you know, what a cinematographer does now, what their latest credits are and so forth, but it was really great to hear about. That's it for Full Exposure from the ASC in Hollywood. I'm your host, Jim Camp. Tony Wisniewski is our executive producer. Dan Walnicki is our editor. Susan Jacob is the colorist. Our associate producers are Kat Cantillo, Huda Khalid, and Stacey Taylor. In Hollywood, Mike Walensky co-produced. Donna Kinski was our cinematographer. Sarah Thomas Moffat was our gaffer. Zolt Magyar was our sound mixer. And Dane Gerwig was our first AC. Our thanks to the American Society of Cinematographers for all their help. Our special thanks to Bill Bennett, Richard Crudo, and Dean Cundy, and John Simmons, ASC. Also thanks to Case Von Oostrom, ASC, Patty Armacost, Alex Lopez, and Tisha Calmeadow. Special thanks to Zeiss Cine LA, Snehal Patel, and Kylie Hazard. Cameras were supplied by Alternative Rentals in LA. Catch us on Instagram at Zeiss underscore Full Exposure, or on the web at ZeissFullExposure.com.